Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News R, India's voice to the world. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj, coming up in the next hour. US House approves legislation to provide $95 billion security assistance to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Russian Foreign Ministry says US is using Ukrainians as cannon fodder. Maldives holds 20th parliamentary elections, 368 candidates in the fray for the 93 seats of People's Majlis. Highlighting countries' approach to think not for itself but for all, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi says India is not only the oldest civilization in the world but also a safe haven for humanity. World Anti-Doping Agency, Global Sports Anti-Doping Watchdog confirmed reports that 23 Chinese swimmers had tested positive for a banned drug before the Tokyo Olympics. Well, the U.S. House of Representatives has passed a series of bills that are expected to provide much-needed aid to Ukraine and Israel. The passage of the four bills comes after weeks of stalling by Republican lawmakers. The Senate still needs to vote on the legislation. Nick Harper reports from Washington. Plenty of political wrangling, but that enormous $96 billion foreign aid package has now passed the House of Representatives, where it has been languishing for weeks. The only way that the House Speaker, Republican Mike Johnson, was able to get this passed was by breaking it up into four individual aid packages, essentially based on different regions. So the largest proportion of that money, 61 billion, went to Ukraine, about 26 billion to Israel, Taiwan and allies in the Indo-Pacific got 8 billion, and then there was a separate bill that looked at a whole range of different issues, including a potential ban on the app TikTok, sanctions on Iran, China, and also looking to seize Russian assets. That, in many ways, was a way to sweeten the deal, to help the hardline conservatives that have been fighting this aid package for many weeks to try and help to get them on board. But bear in mind, many of them still voted against these four bills. And the only way that the House Speaker was able to get it passed was by relying on the Democrats in the House of Representatives. These are not normal times. They're not. Uh, the world is, is destabilized and it's a tinderbox. It's a, it's a dangerous time. Uh, three of our primary adversaries, Russia and Iran and China, are working together and they're being aggressors around the globe. And they're a global threat to our prosperity and our security. Their advance threatens the free world and it demands American leadership. If we turn our backs right now, the consequences could be devastating. So this afternoon, the House acted and we sent over to the Senate and it will be transmitted shortly, our supplemental national security legislation. And that now could potentially cost Mike Johnson, a Republican, his job as Speaker of the House. There is a threat to oust him. At least three Republicans have come forward threatening a potential vote, a vote that could come in the coming days. And if there is enough support, we could see him thrown out of the job, a job he's only been in for several months. Now, this has passed the House of Representatives, these four foreign aid bills. They'll now be moving on to the Senate, and we're expecting votes as early as Tuesday. We're likely to see a swift package, in particular uh, the aid for Ukraine, Israel, and for Taiwan. And the U.S. President Joe Biden has said as soon as it gets to his desk, he will sign off on these, giving much-needed aid packages to those foreign conflicts, aid that President Biden is fighting for and has been wanting to try and get passed for many months now. Nick Harper in Washington, reporting for DD India. Well, the Kremlin has reacted angrily to news that the U.S. Congress has approved an aid package for Ukraine. Russia said on Sunday that the Washington is wading deeper into a hybrid war with Russia 
that would end in a humiliation on a par with Vietnam or Afghanistan. Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova said that it was clear that the United States wanted Ukraine to fight to the last Ukrainian, including with attacks on, on Russian sovereign territory and civilians. All right, and uh, DD India's Dasha Chernyshova joins us from Moscow. Dasha, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov has apparently said that the decision will make the United States of America richer, further ruin Ukraine and result in the deaths of even more Ukrainians. Could you just explain the entire matter? What is it? Well, that's right. That's according to the Kremlin spokesman. Ukraine will get poorer. It will be ruined because the operation of Moscow will have to continue and Moscow will have to destroy more weapons supplied by the Western countries to Ukraine. And that means the loss of even more Ukrainian soldiers. At the same time, according to the rhetoric we are getting here from Moscow, the United States will only get richer because those will be the U.S. corporations, the U.S. weapon producers that will be getting more and more money from the uh, from the U.S. budget uh, as they will be sending those weapons to Ukraine. In the meantime, Moscow does insist that no matter how much Ukraine gets aid from the United States or other countries uh, or NATO, uh, the operation will one way or another achieve its goals. Uh, well, Dasha, uh on Saturday, the U.S. House of Representatives approved more than $60 billion in aid to Ukraine. Uh, could you just tell us what all is included in the package? Well, we understand that in the Ukraine bill, which provides for the 60 billion U.S. dollars of aid that will be provided to Ukraine, the 23 billion U.S. dollars will be used by Washington to replenish its military stockpiles that will be opening the door to more U.S. weapon supplies to Ukraine. We also understand that 14 billion U.S. dollars would go to the Ukrainian Security Assistance Initiative, in which uh, Pentagon buys advanced new weapons to Ukraine and also we understand that there is the provision of 11 billion US dollars to fund current US military operations in the region that is also about the enhancement of the intelligence cooperation between Kiev and Washington another 8 billion US dollars according to the documents will go to the non-military assistance including helping Ukraine to maintain its current operations such as paying salaries but also a very important provision that has been made in in these documents is the possibility of freezing Russian assets and to this the Kremlin has reacted critically saying that would lead to the flight of the investors from the US stock market. All right, you summed it up very nicely, Dasha. Thank you so much for your assessment. Well, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky expressed gratitude to the US after the House passed a bill providing additional funds to Ukraine in its ongoing conflict against Russia. Zelensky said the support, still to be approved by the U.S. Senate, will be used by his country to bring a just end to this conflict. Thanks to each and everyone who supported our package. This is the decision to protect lives. I would like to personally thank Speaker Mike Johnson and all American hearts who, like us in Ukraine, feel that Russian evil must not win. I hope that the package will get considered in the U.S. Senate and forwarded to President Biden fast enough. We appreciate every manifestation of support for our state and our independence, our people and our life, which Russia wants to bury in ruins so much. America has shown its leadership from the first days of this war. U.S. leaders from Democratic President Joe Biden to top Senate Republican Mitch McConnell had been urging embattled Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson to bring the bill up for a vote. U.S. President Joe Biden said in a statement that the bill comes at a moment of grave urgency with Israel facing unprecedented attacks from Iran and Ukraine under continued bombardment from Russia. The legislation now proceeds to the Democratic Majority Senate, which passed a similar measure more than two months ago. The Senate is expected to pass the measure next week, sending it to Biden to sign into law. 
Well, NATO and EU chiefs on Saturday hailed the U.S. House of Representatives' approval of a long-awaited $61 billion aid package for Ukraine and urged the Senate to quickly clear the bill. NATO chief in a statement said that the passing of this bill demonstrates the continued bipartisan support for Ukraine. He said the significant boost in aid will supplement the tens of billions of aid being provided to Ukraine by European allies. He urged Senate to pass the bill and send it to President Biden. While well, two Palestinian attackers tried to shoot and stab Israeli soldiers in the occupied West Bank on Sunday, and in response with this, Israeli soldiers responded with live fire and neutralized both attackers. There was no immediate comment from Palestinian officials. Meanwhile, thousands of Israeli demonstrators across Israel and Jerusalem took to the streets on Saturday to call for new elections and demand more actions from the government to bring the hostages. The conflict between Israel and Iran appears to be de-escalating for now. It's the result of hectic diplomatic efforts by world leaders and their call for restraint both the parties. The effort to ease the tension is still on. DD India's Raghav Kumar Jha reports. Take a look. World leaders called on Iran and Israel to try to avoid escalating tensions following the apparent Israeli airstrike on Friday near an Iranian air base and nuclear facility. Group of seven foreign ministers meeting in Italy warned of new sanctions against Iran for its drone and missile attack on Israel last weekend and urged both sides to avoid worsening the conflict. Meanwhile, Egyptian foreign minister visited Turkey and discussed Iran-Israel tensions and situation in Gaza with his Turkish counterpart. After the meeting, Turkish foreign minister strongly advocated two-state solution for resolving the Middle East crisis. Our first priority should be ending the Israeli occupation and implementing the two-state solution formula. On the other hand, the White House said that the United States is making all efforts to reduce the risk of escalation in the Middle East. Uh, we, we have been very, very clear from here, uh, from the beginning, that we do not want to see uh, this conflict uh, escalate. We continue to consult with our allies and partners, including, uh, including in the region, obviously, and to reduce further risk of escalation. The conflict between Israel and Iran appears de-escalating for now, as Israel has not officially acknowledged its involvement in the attack in Iran, whereas Iran's military and political leaders are also downplaying the attack. Raghav Kumar Jha, reporting for DD India. And in a first since Israel began its campaign in Gaza, a Hamas delegation headed by Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh met with Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan. Haniyeh's visit took place three days after he held talks with Turkish Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan in Doha. Erdogan discussed efforts to deliver humanitarian aid to Gaza and reach a fair and lasting peace in the region with Haniyeh during a meeting in Istanbul. The Turkish presidency said the two sides discussed issues related to Israel's attacks, efforts for adequate and uninterrupted delivery of humanitarian aid to Gaza and a fair and lasting peace process in the region. The visit also came amid escalating regional tensions after Israel's reported attack on Iran this week. Ardwan emphasized during the meeting that Israel should not benefit from the development between Iran and Israel. Campaigners are warning about wide-ranging consequences of new migration rules that have come into effect in the United Kingdom. Immigration is a big theme ahead of country's general elections due later this year, leading the government to tighten the rules on moving to the country. DD India correspondent Julia Chapman reports from London. Take a look. There are many reasons why foreign citizens choose to move to the UK. Working and studying are among the most common. Blessing, not her real name, left her home in Nigeria to pursue a degree in the UK. She chose the country because it allowed students to bring their families with them. But to her surprise, the visa applications for her three children were rejected, even though she has sole custody. It's really difficult for a single woman with children here I don't know, I might be wrong, but I think that's where they are looking out. As in, how will you take care of these children? I want you, at the end of the day, come to us for help. So we're not used to government taking care of us. It's never been, and I don't think it will be. So we're not expecting that. 
After finishing her studies, Blessing decided to stay to become a care worker, looking after elderly people with dementia. She's among dozens of women in her field who have been denied the opportunity to bring their dependents with them. Those rejections were made even before the tighter rules came into effect. The women came, they wanted to settle for two to three months. They did, then made the applications only to learn that the Home Office turned that against them by giving the reason that they didn't meet the sole responsibility test and that whoever they left their children with back in their home countries, those children can stay there. So bearing in mind that some of these children were left with neighbours, with nannies, with elderly parents or grandparents, with friends. The care sector faces a huge labour shortage, forcing employers to recruit from abroad. The government says it doesn't expect its new policy to have a major impact because of high levels of global labour supply. But the industry warns that the best candidates will be put off if they can't bring their families. It isn't just care workers affected by new home office rules. Master's students are also no longer able to bring families with them when they come to the UK to study. And even British citizens are facing higher income thresholds to bring family members that hold foreign passports. The government says this is all part of its plan to bring down net migration, which it insists will create a fairer society for British people. Blessing is now submitting fresh visa applications for her children. If she's unsuccessful, she plans to leave the UK. She says no job is worth separating her family any longer. Julia Chapman in London, reporting for DD India. And still to come on DD India News R. US House moves bill to ban TikTok to Senate. Revised legislation will now head to the Senate. Twenty-five years on, uh, Columbine school shooting remembered at Memorial. Traditional knowledge can often help us gain new prospects for the future. Speaking of traditions, what did you have for lunch today? We thought that through Sputnik Farms, uh, we can try to create more resilient and more sustainable kind of food system. We wanted to recover the art of weaving we knew as children. We founded the Nurupu Collective, which aims to improve the situation of weavers here. By working with this parametric modeling, we can change uh, the city and uh, visualize it in, in several different ways. So that's a very strong uh, mechanism in the digital twin, just working with parametric uh, visualization. In the IPCC, we have a range of different you know, climate modelling scenarios ranging from low emission scenarios to really high emission scenarios and kind of everything in between. You're watching DD Indian News, I'm Siddharth Bharatwaj. A bipartisan majority of the US House of Representatives voted on Saturday in favor of a bill that could effectively ban the TikTok app in the United States. The House of Representatives voted 360 to 58 on the updated ban bill. The initial version of the bill had faced a roadblock in the Senate before this move. Earlier, a standalone bill with a six-month deadline for selling TikTok had received overwhelming bipartisan support in the House back in March. Both Democrats and Republicans had expressed concerns about national security due to the app's ownership by the Chinese tech company. The revised legislation will now head to the Senate. And at least two dead and six injured after a shooting at a block party in Tennessee of United States. Police said the shooting happened at a block party where up to 300 people were gathered. The investigation into the shooting remains ongoing. This was a block party in the Orange Mound Park that was occurring, as far as we know, without a permit. There were approximately 200 to 300 people in attendance at this event. In light of recent events, we stand together to denounce the senseless acts of violence in our community. We are working 
tirelessly tonight to identify the individuals who were involved in this shooting. U.S. marks the 25th anniversary of Columbine shooting. 25 years ago, a shooting incident shocked Colorado. On April 20th, 1999, two students stormed through the school armed with multiple guns, killing 12 students and one teacher before fatally turning the guns on themselves in the library. In 1999, the nation watched in horror that day as television aired live images of students fleeing the building while police surrounded it. Bloodied students were attended to by first responders and others tearfully embraced each other as terrified parents arrived at the school waiting for news about their children. U.S. President Biden, joined by other members of his administration on Saturday, marked the 25th anniversary of the Columbine High School massacre in Colorado. President Biden expressed his sympathy in statement memorializing the victims. In his statement, Biden noted that Columbine, which at the time was deadliest shooting at a K-12 school, has been followed by hundreds of other mass school shootings. Biden commemorated the day by again calling on Congress to pass new gun violence legislation. Though the president signed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act into law in 2022, the package lagged a number of gun violence initiatives he would push for, including nationally mandated background checks for firearm purchases, a new national red flag law and the reinstitution of the 1994 federal ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris spoke with a survivor of the 1999 school massacre to mark the incident's 25th anniversary. The survivor of the incident shared her horrific tale and explained that it took her 20 years to seek professional trauma therapy. Meanwhile, Vice President Kamala Harris said more needed to be done to tackle gun violence in the country. And dozens visited a memorial to the victims of the school shooting, marking 25 years since the tragedy. Visitors silently took in the memorial stones and crosses bearing the names of the dead and injured. Planning for the Columbine Memorial began just two months after the shooting. It opened to the public in September 2007. And news from Venezuela now. Venezuela's major opposition coalition will back Edmundo Gonzalez for president in July's election. A prominent Venezuelan opposition member, Maria Corina Machado, who was barred from running as a candidate, posted a video on Saturday backing former diplomat Edmundo Gonzalez to run against President Nicolas Maduro. Gonzalez's candidacy was finalized on Friday, a day before a Saturday deadline to replace him with someone else. Several other potential contenders were either barred from office or prevented from registering. Venezuela's top court upheld a ban on Machado from holding public office. News from the United States. Election campaigning is in full swing and so is the fundraising battle in the U.S. for the upcoming presidential elections. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump's election campaign reported on Saturday raised $15 million in March, a significant increase from the prior month. Trump has uh, persistently trailed Democratic President Joe Biden in fundraising as they prepare to face off in the November 5 presidential election. It was not clear from his financial disclosure submitted to the Federal Election Commission if Trump gained any ground in the fundraising battle. Biden was also due on Saturday to report his campaign's financial situation at the end of March. Trump previously reported he raised nearly $11 million in February. And in a significant development for maritime operations, the Port of Baltimore has inaugurated a third temporary channel to facilitate the entry and departure of boats. The debris and wreckage removal will help open an access channel allowing one-way ship traffic to the port of Baltimore. The Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed into the Patapsco River in the early morning of March 26, killing six men after the massive container ship lost power and crashed into a support pylon. The bodies of two victims are still missing. Replacing the bridge will likely take years, but authorities have opened two temporary channels to allow some shallow draft vessels to move around the stricken container vessel. 
and polls to the people's majlis, which is the parliament in Maldives, are being held today. In the fourth multi-party parliamentary elections, the archipelago nation will elect representatives from out of 368 candidates across 93 constituencies. As the Med Department predicts, a rainy day in Mali, over 2.8 lakh voters will exercise their franchise at 602 polling stations, including three polling stations abroad. In Colombo, Sri Lanka, Thiruvananthapuram in India and Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. The polls are being seen as a crucial litmus test for the incumbent president, Dr. Mohamed Moizu's party, which has been under fire by the opposition for its policies now. All right, and Dr. Ahmed Muin Fiyuki, who is DD India correspondent, is joining us from Colombo. Ahmed, how's the atmosphere there right now as these uh, polls are being seen as crucial litmus test for the incumbent president, Dr. Mohammed Muizuz? Uh, Siddharth, yes, uh, it's a very crucial election, uh, uh, primarily speaking. Uh, uh, in September 2023, we had seen the presidential election in which um, uh, Dr. Mohammed Muizu had uh, defeated his uh, predecessor. Uh, Ibrahim Soli, uh, riding on a campaign of India out. Uh, now, this is something which we have to uh, remember because uh, after that, there have been several decisions with, taken by the Muizu government, uh, which uh, had more China-leaning kind of a stance, while uh, there were a few decisions which had an anti-India stance as well. Uh, there was also a, a, a situation where there was a diplomatic row between the two countries, India and uh, Maldives. Uh, therefore, this election has been seen as uh, something which is kind of a referendum on uh, the policies and the decisions of the Muizu government and uh, how the people would be perceiving uh, these kinds of decisions. Now, uh, in addition to that, uh, as of now, uh, as per the last uh, reports that have come in uh, till 3 p.m. local time in Maldives, that's around 3.30 p.m. Indian time, uh, the uh, polls have uh, report recorded around 56 percent of uh, uh, voting uh, in the entire uh, Maldives. Uh, the elections will go on until 5.30 p.m. and thereafter the counting would uh, come in later on today right. in the evening itself. All right. Uh, Ahmed, now give some brief details on, you know, how's the situation between Moldavian Democratic Party, MDP, and the People's National Congress, PNC, and their supporters as well. You know, some reports, however, say that the MDP has an upper hand when it comes to elections there. How do you assess this? Uh, you see, uh, Siddharth, it's a very, very, uh, you know, uh, a tough battle between these two uh, uh, parties. There have been ups and downs for both. And uh, it has always, almost always been, uh, you know, uh, the election uh, uh, of the presidential election. After that, the six months later, you have the parliamentary election. More so, the same party normally uh, uh, gets a majority. That has what has happened in the previous time as well. Uh, but this time around, what is being seen and what is being perceived, you're right for this. MDP has an upper hand. Uh, there are three, four reasons for this. Primarily speaking, one, uh, in Mali, there was a mayoral election after uh, Mohamed Muizu had vacated his uh, position. And MDP had wrested control over that. Mali, uh, it comprises bulk of the seats. And so, therefore, uh, this is something which will also be uh, useful if to weigh in on what exactly is uh, uh, likely to be the outcome in the parliamentary election. This is one. The second is Abdullah Yamin, to whom uh, uh, the PNC and PPM combined hmm. primarily have allegiance to. Hmm. Uh, he has walked out of the combine and he has made a new party, PNF. And this is something which is very crucial because he has a loyal voter base. And that is something which is very crucial and it is going to make a huge dent into the PPM, PNC votes. And uh, there is a likelihood that uh, uh, this will be a very uh, crucial factor in deciding uh, the election uh, uh, that's been happening today. That. Okay, Ahmed, if I'm not wrong, uh, then the Maldivian Democratic Party, which is the MDP, is currently governing the parliament. And if this party comes back to power again, then what would it mean for India? Uh, see, there are lots of variables here. Firstly, yes, uh, in the previous uh, majlis, the total, uh, uh, the membership was 87. After seven members were suspended and they were removed uh, uh, after they were made uh, ministers, uh, the total membership came to 80. Out of these 80, MDP had 44 members. Mm. Uh, and in addition to that, there were 13 members from the Democrats. So these two, the MDP and the Democrats, they had around uh, 57 uh, uh, members in the entire uh, uh, majlis. Now, if MDP and the Democrats and the other uh, like-minded parties, if they get a uh, two-third majority, it will become really easy for uh, the opposition, the, these parties, 
to pass any bill and even in fact even uh, to go ahead with the impeachment process which was being contemplated in february this year in fact abdul ayamin also called for the impeachment of president muizu and this is something which is uh, something uh, uh, the current government all right. of maldives will not uh, be hoping for all right with this thank you so much uh, ahmed muin faruki and thank you so much for your assessment all right and still to come on dd in news r Heat wave situation prevails in parts of India, especially eastern parts of the country. IMD issues red alert in West Bengal. India's weather department has issued yellow alert for thunderstorms with lightning at isolated places on April 22nd and 23rd. has reached here in Bangaluru or Bangalore, the capital of the down south pole bound Karnataka. National elections are more, more worried about national security. The right person, if you want, will take your country in a right direction. Voting is very important because the only rights we have. It is a straight contest between the two arch rivals, the ruling dispensation Congress party and the principal opposition BJP. You're watching DD in a news hour. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. A quick recap of the headlines. Maldives holds 20th parliamentary elections. 368 candidates in the fray for the 93 seats of People's Majlis. Highlighting country's approach to think not for itself but for whole. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi says... India is not only the oldest civilization in the world, but also a safe haven for humanity. World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA, a global sports anti-doping watchdog, confirmed reports that 23 Chinese swimmers had tested positive for a banned drug before the Tokyo Olympics. Sri Lanka on Sunday marks fifth anniversary of deadly blasts that rocked the nation on Easter Day in 2019. The blast targeted three churches and three luxury hotels in Sri Lanka, which claimed the lives of 269 people. The fears of violence forced hundreds of residents to flee their homes amid bomb scares, lockdowns and security sweeps. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will travel to China next week to hold talks with senior officials in Shanghai and Beijing. And this is the, uh, Blinken's second visit to China in less than a year. During his visit, Blinken will hold talks with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi in Beijing on a range of bilateral, regional and global issues. The visit follows a phone call this month between Biden and Xi in which they pledged to keep high-level contacts open. Since that call... Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has visited China and Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin has spoken by phone with his Chinese counterpart. Meetings at lower levels also have taken place. One crew member died and seven were injured after two of Japan's military helicopters crashed during nighttime training on Saturday. The helicopters were conducting anti-submarine exercises near Torishima in the remote Aizu Island, a group of southern coast of central Japan. The cause of the crash is yet to be determined. Japan's Defense Minister Minoru Kihara said that the Maritime Self-Defense Force is currently conducting a search operation in the area. Seven of the eight people on the board, the two aircraft are unaccounted for. The Maritime Self-Defense Forces is currently conducting a search operation of the area and has confirmed what seems to be a part of the aircraft at the site, so the aircraft are believed to have crashed. 
All right, let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. Two custom officials were shot dead by unknown gunmen in Western Pakistan on Sunday. The recent attack is followed by the killing of five other customs officials in the area in recent days. And as the investigations are underway, no group has claimed responsibility for the two attacks since Thursday. Hundreds of people attended a candlelit vigil at Bondi Beach on Sunday evening to remember the victims of Australia's worst mass killings in years with speeches, music and a minute silence. Six people were killed and many more injured when Joel Kauchi carried out his murderous rampage on 13th of April. Let's now get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. Campaigning for the second phase of election scheduled for April 26 gains momentum. Political parties engaged to garner support from voters for their respective parties. Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi addressed an election rally in Rajasthan's Jalor on Sunday. The Prime Minister outlined the government's achievements in Rajasthan as well as central schemes implemented in the state. Addressing the rally, Prime Minister criticized Congress party. This party ne kabhi... 400 सांसद जीते थे उनके आज वो 300 सीट पे चुनाव नहीं लड़ पा रहे आज कांग्रेस की हालत ये है उनको उम्मीदवार नहीं मिल रहे इन्होंने अवसरवादी इंडी अलायंस बना लिया है उसकी पतंग उड़ने से पहले ही कट गई है कहने को तो गठबंधन है लेकिन अब हालत देखिए कई राज्य है जहां एक गठबंधन वाले ही आपस में लड़ रहे हैं इस लोकसभा के चुनाव में देश में 25 प्रतिशत सीटें ऐसी हैं जहां एक गठबंधन के लोग एक दूसरे को मारने काटने में लगे हैं एक दूसरे के खिलाफ चुनाव लड़ रहे हैं अगर जिसको चुनाव के पहले इतनी लड़ाई चल रही है तो चुनाव के बाद लूट के लिए तो कितना ज्यादा लड़ाई लड़ेंगे इसकी कल्पना कर सकते हैं as the campaigning for the second phase of general elections 2024 goes on, BJP's national president JP Nadda addressed a public rally in western state of Maharashtra's Buldhana. During his address, Nadda took a jibe at Congress and pledged to make India Vikasid Bharat by 2047 or developed India by 2047. Bharat <laughs> ko. 2024 के बाद 2047 तक विकसित भारत बनाने का संकल्प है उसका चुनाव है इसको हमको ध्यान में रखना BJP national president JP Nadda will also campaign in Karnataka and will also hold a meeting with party officials discussing the strategy of the party focusing on the second phase Also senior BJP leader and union home minister Amit Shah who is campaigning for the second phase of Lok Sabha elections, addressed a public rally in eastern state of Bihar's Katihar, praising Prime Minister Narendra Modi during the rally. He said many things. Modi ji ne जातिवाद और तुष्टिकरण को भी समाप्त करने का काम नरेंद्र मोदी जी ने किया है और मोदी जी ने हर एक व्यक्ति का विकास करने का काम नरेंद्र मोदी जी ने किया ये दस साल के अंदर मोदी जी ने गरीबों के जीवन में बहुत बड़ा परिवर्तन लाने का काम किया है Leaders of India Alliance also crisscrossing states to garner support in favor of their candidates. 
Congress General Secretary Priyanka Vadra will address the election meeting in favor of Congress candidate Bhupesh Baghel in Chhattisgarh, Dongargaon. Congress's senior leader P. Chidambaram held a press conference in southern state of Kerala, Tiruvananthapuram today and said that the Congress will win all the seats in Kerala and Tamil Nadu in Lok Sabha elections. Chidambaram also said that CPIM has no special role in this election and is restricted to one or two states. Honorable CM cannot apply double standards. He is making accusations. There is a vast difference between accusation and conviction. In India, the law is, at least so far, every person is presumed innocent until found guilty. Mr. Pinarai Vijayan, Honorable CM of Kerala, should not make accusations. If there is a case, the case will go on. The judgment will come. And then we can decide whether a person is guilty or not. How can you make accusations? I have never made accusations against anyone. The Communist Party of India Marxist leader Sitaram Yachuri also addressed a public rally in Kerala's Trivandrum. A central election committee meeting of the Congress party was held at the party headquarters in New Delhi today. The meeting, chaired by Congress President Malikarjun Karge and party leader Sonia Gandhi, was held over Lok Sabha elections 2024. Bahujan Samaj Party's National President Mayawati addressed an election rally in Uttar Pradesh's Amroha. All right, and DD India's Dibendu model joins us from Bihar. Dibendu, uh, tell us exactly where you are right now and uh, what is the political scenario saying about Bihar and is there anything which is making these elections interesting this time around? Uh, well, Siddharth, I am in Katihar in Bihar. It's uh, uh, a part of the Simanchal region in Bihar. So there are five seats uh, from this particular region which is going to polls in the second phase. Uh, which includes the seat where I am, which is the Katihar seat, the neighbouring Purnia, Kishanganj, uh, Banka and Bhagalpur are the few other seats in this region, uh, which is going to polls in the second phase, which is on the 26th of April. Hmm. So what's special is this, uh, you know, like uh, this time around, uh, BJP's ally, the JDU, is contesting from all these five seats against uh, the Indi Alliance, uh, which includes uh, the Congress, RJD, as well as the CPIM. Uh, interestingly, uh, in the Kishan Gun seat, which has about 68% uh, of minority population, there the A AIMIM has also given a candidate uh, to contest in that particular seat. Uh, the Katihar seat is, of course, a very uh, a, a seat of the BJP, uh, which had been with the BJP for the last uh, almost two and a half uh, decades. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Congress, uh, erstwhile this seat was with the Congress's Tariq Anwar, who is once again contesting. Uh, this time around on a Congress ticket from this particular seat and he's contesting against uh, the JDU which is the BJP's uh, alliance partner in Bihar, uh, JDU's Dulal uh, Sharma uh, from this particular uh, constituency. So of course uh, the uh, it will be interesting because uh, you know it is uh, mostly a two corner fight in this particular uh, seat of Bihar and uh, almost in all the uh, seats in the Simanchal region which is going to polls. Uh, it will witness a two-corner seat. The issues perhaps in these regions are, of course, uh, employment. Uh, it's, it's mostly an agrarian society. So agriculture, farmers, uh, OBCs. Uh, remember, Siddharth, caste also plays a very important factor in Bihar. Mm. So uh, keeping in mind the caste combinations here, the tickets were distributed both by the Congress as well as uh, by the BJP. So uh, OBC uh, in this particular constituency where I am in Katihar, OBC uh, has about... 18 to 19 percent of vote share as per the latest caste census that was done by the Bihar government. So, of course, uh, you know, uh, in today's uh, uh, Home Minister's Amit Shah, when he was visiting in Katihar this afternoon, he did speak about the OBC and he appealed uh, mm. to the OBCs to vote for the All BJP, right. uh, in fact, for the JDU candidate in uh, the alliance uh, in which JDU, BJP, and LJP are in. So, of course, he also mentioned about how Prime Minister Narendra Modi is working for the upliftment of the OBCs 
Mm -hmm. uh, not only in Bihar but also elsewhere in the country. All right. Because OBCs in this particular constituency will play a significant role. Yes. All right. Uh, Dibendu, stay with us. I'll come back to you. Uh, but right now, we've also been joined by DD India correspondent Prasenjit Bakshi, who's joining us from West Bengal. Uh, Prasenjit, a very good evening to you. Uh, now, can you just tell us how are things there in West Bengal as far as the elections are concerned? Look, uh, interestingly, I was uh, watching and listening to a press conference of Congress leader P. Chidambaram in Kerala. Okay. He was uh, talking something about uh, against the Chief Minister of Kerala, Pinarai Bijaran. At the same time, when he was holding the press conference, at the same time, hmm. here in Kolkata Press Club, we had a press conference, joint press conference of uh, a Congress leader of Parliament, Adhir Ranjan Chaudhary, and the senior most CPIM leader, Biman Basu. Hmm, hmm, hmm. This is the dichotomy of, uh, of, of this Indi alliance in uh, the, in the country, in the recent this this ongoing poll, hmm. in one uh, um, state they are fighting each other, uh, and in uh, another state in West Bengal they are holding press conference together. So this is the situation in the second phase of uh, polling. Uh, three uh, constituencies are there in the northern part of uh, West Bengal, that is Darjeeling, um, uh, Balurghat, and uh, Raiganj. Particularly in this uh, um, second phase, Balur Ghat is very important for West Bengal BJP because uh, the state president of BJP, Mr. Shukanta Majumdar, is fighting there to retain his um, uh, 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 seat there in Balur Ghat. And at the same time, also in uh, Darjeeling, which is always uh, strategically very important for the security of the country and, the, and in other way, there, uh, the incumbent uh, member of parliament of BJP, Mr. Raju Bist, is contesting for the second time. So, uh, this is very interesting uh, for the second phase that how uh, BJP is, would, would be able to maintain their, their uh, uh, stronghold in northern part of West Bengal, Raiganj, the third, that, that was also uh, a BJP uh, MP uh, in the 2019. So, uh, uh, this is the, the, the entire uh, northern region where BJP is in stronghold. This is one side and the other side, as I told you, that here Congress and CPIM, they are in alliance. Well, certainly uh, political parties are certainly trying to uh, keep their foothold strong in the region. But President Jeet, can you just tell us how excited are people there uh, to go to the polls to cast their ballots, especially the first time voters? You had a word with them? Right, absolutely. Uh, look, uh, this is very interesting because uh, West Bengal always highest in percentage of uh, casting poll. Mm. Uh, this time also in the first phase it was more than 80%, mm. uh, around mm. 82 uh, uh, to 83% in mm. the mm. first phase of three constituencies. Mm. And we hope that uh, this time also in the second phase, uh, including the first time voters, um, uh, the percentage will remain more than 80% and that is uh, one of the uh, most, uh, what I must say, that that is the most uh, uh, proud uh, thing for the people of West Bengal, the citizens of West Bengal. Here the new voters also, mm. they uh, cast with, uh, with that type of uh, energy and excitement uh, what uh, senior citizens also do. So uh, 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 here voting is really uh, a festival, mm. uh, apart from the notorious violence for which West Bengal is known. But uh, thankfully, this time the first phase went on peacefully, and we hope that the uh, other phases is also um, uh, 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 we also go on in a peaceful manner. But the way the first time voter is responding, that is really good. Well, definitely, and uh, Prasenji, not just uh, in West Bengal, but in the entire nation, in entire India. Uh, election here is not just an electoral process; it's a festival. Now, going uh, coming back to you, uh, Dibendu, uh, tell us. How excited people are to vote there and what all is helping masses in that region to make them realize the importance of voting? Oh, uh, well, Siddharth, you know, unfortunately, although uh, Bihar is a very politically aware and politically active state, hmm. Hmm. Uh, but if we see the data of the election commission, we have seen that Bihar has not been very enthusiastic of uh, coming out and voting. Uh, well, uh, it's of course a matter of research as to why people who are so politically active and aware in a state like Bihar uh, don't come to the polling station to vote. Uh, even if you look at the first phase, uh, the voting was less than, in fact, less than 50% in Bihar. 
Uh, if you look at the 2019 data, Bihar polled uh, at about 56 to 58 percent, if I may recall correctly. Hmm. Uh, it was not more than 58 percent for sure. Hmm. So, of course, if you look at the trend uh, nationally, Bihar's polling percentage has been quite less for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, because it, it people might think that, okay, they want to continue with the status quo and this is mm. one of the reasons which mm. are being analysed by political analysts for the low voter turnout overall if you look at for the first right. phase of the 2019 elections. All right. uh, I, I beg your pardon for the 2024 election because uh, when people are, are okay with the status quo, they don't generally come out of the house uh, and go to the polling stations to uh, vote. All right, the so Bengal, as Prasenjit was saying, is an exception. But of course, uh, in, in many parts of the country where if you see there is a, uh, a less number of voters the now, all right. that the incumbent is in favor. Yes, sorry, back to you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dibendu, who's joining us from Bihar and also Prasenji joining us from West Bengal. Thank you both of you for your analysis. Well, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi attended the Bhagwan Mahavir Nirvan Mahotsav in the national capital New Delhi on Sunday on the occasion of Mahavir Jayanti. He also released a commemorative stamp and coin at the inauguration of the event. India is observing Mahavir Jayanti today. Every year on the 13th day of the Hindu calendar's lunar fortnight, Jain followers celebrate the birth anniversary of Lord Mahavir. Here's a report. Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Sunday inaugurated the 2550th Bhagwan Mahavir Nirvan Mahotsav at the Bharat Mandapam in the national capital on the occasion of Mahavir Jayanti. He also released a commemorative stamp and coin at the event. Addressing thousands of people who had come to Bharat Mandapam for the festival, PM Modi said, Hum dhai hajar vars baad bhi, aaj भगवान महावीर का निर्वाण दिवस मना रहे हैं सदियों और सहस्राब्दियों में सोचने का यह सामर्थ्य ये दूरदर्शी और दुर्गामी सोच इसलिए ही भारत न केवल विश्व की सबसे प्राचीन जीवित सभ्यता है बल्कि Referring to the ongoing wars across the world, PM Modi said, Today, Mahavir Jayanti marks the birth anniversary of the founder of Jainism. The Jain community celebrates the festival to observe peace and harmony and spread the teachings of Mahavir, the 24th Tirthankar of Jainism. Mahavir Jayanti is celebrated by taking a procession with Mahavir's idol on a chariot and people reciting religious songs on the way. Jains also celebrate this day by doing charity, praying, observing fasts, visiting Jain temples, conducting mass prayers and meditating. Akshay Dongre's report for DD India. Parts of India reeled under severe heat wave on Sunday as the regions, especially the eastern states, witnessed hotter than usual day at the onset of summer season. India expects 10 to 20 heatwave days, which is described as temperatures hitting at least 40 degrees Celsius in the plains from April through June this year versus the normal 4 to 8 days. India Meteorological Department has issued red alert in eastern state of West Bengal for the coming 4 to 5 days. In this case, the heatwave prevail in East India. And our opinion is that the coming 4-5 days वहां कुछ ना कुछ राज्यों में हीट वेव चलता रहेगा और चलिए अब स्पेसिफिकली बात करते हैं बेस्ट बंगाल की बेस्ट बंगाल में आज के लिए हमने रेड अलर्ट दे रखा है उसका कारण क्या है कि वहां हीट वेव टू सीवियर हीट वेव प्रवेल कर रहा है मेन जो टेंपरेचर सामान्य से है कुछ हिस्सों में 6.5 डिग्री से भी ज्यादा है और कुछ हिस्सों में 4.5 डिग्री में तो उसके लिए आज हमने रेड अलर्ट दे रखा है इसके साथ ही वहां पे वार्म नाइट भी है टेंपरेचर्स भी जो मिनिमम टेंपरेचर भी हैं वो भी सामान्य से ज्यादा है 
इसके लिए आज हमने वहां रेड अलर्ट दे रखा है और कल से हमारा अनुमान है कि वहां टेम्परेचर में थोड़ी गिरावट आ सकती है और उसके बाद आने वाले चार दिनों के लिए ऑरेंज अलर्ट दे रखा है India's weather department has issued yellow alert for thunderstorms with lightning at isolated places on April 22nd and 23 as heavy rain and snowfall batters northern state of Himachal Pradesh at least 104 roads and three national highways were blocked in the state IMD had also suggested that the weather could change for the worse causing disruption in day to day activities Now the World Anti-Doping Agency WADA confirmed reports that 23 chinese swimmers tested positive for a banned drug before the 2020 tokyo olympics but it accepted the country's findings that this was due to substance contamination multiple media reports said that the swimmers tested positive for tmz which is found in heart medication months before the covid delayed games began in the japanese capital in july 2021 china's anti doping agency chinada called the reports misleading and said the positive results had been inadvertent chinada said the swimmers had tested positive for extremely low concentration of tmz after inadvertently being exposed to the substance through contamination and should not be held responsible for the positive results wada said it was notified in june 2021 of chinada's decision to accept that the swimmers returned adverse analytical findings after inadvertently being exposed to the drug through contamination china's 30 member swimming team won six medals at the tokyo games including three golds all right didi nyas narayan singh joins us live on this narayan what's the entire matter and how has the sports fraternity reacted to it shinada although has said that the reports are misleading uh if you take a look at the whole matter uh, it was just before the tokyo olympics that uh, 23 chinese swimmer was found of the banned substance tmz uh, after the reports were emerged and an independent investigation by the new york times and the Ger- german tv they found that uh, it has been done and the world anti doping agency which governs the doping cases in the world said that uh, they accepted the chinese theory they accepted the whatever explanation was given by the chinese authority but thing is that uh, if such cases were uh, we can say that the world body gives so less attention to such thing definitely it's not good for the game not good for the athletes who are clean athletes and if the theory given by the chinese authority that you can say that the pill the the medicine that is used that tms it is available in the pill form and how the pill can contaminate the whole kitchen and the whole drainage system it raises a question and when the new york times uh, according to reports uh, when they uh, just uh, met the experts anti doping experts five independent anti doping expert then these experts also said that uh, uh, they find these investigation by the china and the wada it's uh, uh, plausible not only this the german television who uh, did this investigation they also said when they talk to the whistleblower chinese whistleblower who, all right uh, put this matter forward they mm-hmm. said that it's looking like a fairy tale story so it's not good for the game and also it raises the questions over the integrity of the world doping agency and uh, it will not it it will it will just put a bad precedence in the coming times if such cases uh, comes again all right thank you so much narayan for your analysis all right that's all for this edition of dd india news hour but let us know your thoughts on the news of the day for those uh, on the go you can uh, get all the latest news and updates from india and across the world on dd india mobile app the app is available on both android and ios